Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. My name is Peter, recovered alcoholic. Yeah. Uh, grateful to be alive and sober. Uh, guys, hear me okay? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Grateful to be alive and sober and uh, get to share the next few weeks about this message and this book and what my God has done for me. And um, if uh, we continue to seek what he'll continue to do for us. Um, something I wanted to share, I was sharing with some folks this afternoon before we get going. Um, Dr. Harry Tebow wrote some stuff about reemergence of ego uh, a whole bunch of years ago, and I shared it with some new folks today. Hopefully it resonated. Uh, it certainly resonates with me and those of us who've been around a while. Uh, there's some readings by Thomas Merton, uh, some writings by Thomas Merton. Um, when we see, uh, you can see his influence here um, in uh, reemergence of ego and the separation from God. And uh, he writes the following. Um, the so-called typical alcoholic is a narcissistic, egocentric core dominated by feelings of omnipotence, intent on maintaining at all costs its integrity. Inwardly, the alcoholic brooks no control for man or God. He, the alcoholic, is and must be master of his destiny. He will fight to the end to preserve that position. If the alcoholic can truly accept the presence of a power greater than himself, which is step two consideration, He, by that very step, modifies at least temporarily and possibly permanently his deepest inner structure. And when he does so without resentment or struggle, then he is no longer typically alcoholic. And the strange thing is that if the alcoholic can sustain that inner feeling of acceptance, he can and will remain sober for the rest of his life, which challenges and flies right in the face of hanging in there doing a day at a time. He goes on to say, a religious or spiritual awakening is the act of giving up one's reliance on one's own omnipotence. The defined individuality no longer defies but accepts help, guidance, and control from the outside. And as the individual relinquishes his negative, aggressive feelings towards himself and towards life, he finds himself overwhelmed by strongly positive ones such as love, friendliness, peacefulness, and pervading contentment, which state is the exact and the opposite of the former relentless, restless irritability, which is kind of like what the great fact is talking about. He says they must lose the narcissistic element permanently, otherwise the program of AA works only temporarily. Regardless of his final conception of that power, unless the individual attains in the course of a time a sense of of the reality and nearness of a a power greater than themselves, his egocentric nature will reassert itself with undiminished intensity, and drinking will again enter into the picture. Um, What a warning. What it's telling me is I will experience this reemergence of ego, and the ego will never tell me it's reemerging. And what happens to someone like me as I start to drift away from the solution, and I will defend myself to the end. You're wrong, and I'm right. All of you are wrong, and I'm right. I will defend inappropriate behavior and make it very appropriate. I will defend unspiritual behavior and make it spiritual. And it will slowly drift away from God. And who has become God is me. How can I meet God? How can I experience God if I am now God? Now, my ego tells me I'm praying and worshiping God. I'm meditating. I'm doing all the spiritual disciplines. But what I am doing when I'm praying is worshiping me. And my ego is being talk, is talking to me. And my sponsor becomes an obstacle, and the any lens he tells me to do becomes in the way. And suddenly things get busy. Things get in the way of me experiencing God. So what I have found that the only thing I can do is when I bottom out in this place is once again a surrender like I always do. Most of us need to do is a complete surrender and continually rework in the first nine steps to clear self out and experience the sunlight of the spirit, the less self, more God. Well, one thing I was made clear on a long time ago, when I pray and I surrender and I beg, I cannot command the Spirit to do what I want. You'll see some of these athletes, they make the sign of the cross before they get up there like God's going to grant them a grand slam home run. (laughs) And even us, when we pray, we will pray to have God go along with our plans of what we're secretly doing. God, give me this so I can do that. 
God just doesn't operate that way. He'll give an abundance if it's along his will. And my job in the praying is uh, 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 showing a willingness to be aligned with his will. That's what, that's what the prayer is really all about. We have wonderful words and different prayers. We're not commanding the spirit that to convey a thought of my willingness, my readiness to be changed and do whatever God has for me. And then really, that's why it's what we're doing, not what we're saying that counts. I want to do any lens. And my sponsor says, take a white chip. And I say, I'm not doing it. My sponsor says, make 90 meetings in 90 days. I'm not doing it. My sponsor says, go to that meeting. I don't want to go because there are conditions on this. Well, what happened to my prayer? So really what I'm doing, I'm mouthing any length, but my actions are my lens, not what the sponsor tells me. And what I have found out is when we say we concede to our innermost self, I did it. In different words, June 23rd, 1988, my last separation from alcohol, I conceded to my innermost self. What was different about that concession compared to my fifth treatment center uh, concession when I used two days after treatment? Is that 1988, it was followed up with actions purely out of desperation. I mean, I couldn't tie my own shoelaces without seeking counsel because I didn't know how to do it. I just took direction. It was really out of just desperation, nothing else. I wasn't looking to be a talker in AA or even make coffee. I wasn't even thinking about AA in 1988. I don't want to die as the plea. I made a plea, and then I took some action. And that action was, I was being pushed to take that action because I couldn't deny what God had for me. There's something that goes, uh, that this body that is sown uh, uh, in dishonor gets glory. And it's only through God. We get to experience the glory of God in our false times only by pursuing, only by seeking. And I tell newcomers all the time when they tell me, well, that's a little extreme for any lens. I don't know if I want to go to any lens. And they give you lots of excuses, which means they still want to use. And my question to them is, did you go, like I did, any lens to get drunk, any lens to get high? I would go anywhere, do anything for the price of a drink or some powder, right? And we come into A and they say, pray twice a day. Well, that's a little extreme. <laughs> You know, my sponsor says I have to stop my fourth step. I think I'm going to get another sponsor. What, what I get to do in Alcoholics Anonymous, even to the many, any lengths that God has put in front of me to pick up my cross and go, is like kissing a newborn on the cheek compared to the work I had to do to keep drunk. When the reemergence of ego happens, I start to go backwards the same way I went forwards through the steps. So a book says we concede to our innermost self. It's the first step. Not literally the first step as written, but the first step towards getting well. It's my concession, my surrender that I know at a gut level, and that's a spiritual thing when that happens. It's not an exercise in intellect. At a gut level, no one has to tell me. It's it's an experience in here where I realize I am in serious trouble. I can't stop drinking. I am alcoholic, and I need help. And even with that concession, all it does when I say please help, it places me in a position to be changed. Am I willing to, to go to any lengths to do that? When our book says in chapter two, Agnostics, uh, God is everything or nothing, they really mean everything. Because if he's not everything, then he really is nothing. And on both considerations, what I did was was an exercise in intellect. Yeah, God's everything. But he really wasn't, because my actions didn't show it. And it's a setup for what we're going to see in step three. When we make a decision, I made a decision to turn everything over to God, my thinking and my life, my actions. It's an uncomfortable uh, experience for the ego when ego finds out that the life is none of its business anymore. And before the spiritual transformation has ha- happens, many of us who don't want to admit it, we are our ego. We're walking, there's a spirit in there. The person in the crack house right now, the person drinking booze on the bridge right now, has just as much God in them as the Pope in Rome, but there's no relationship. But prior to the spiritual experience, I was my ego. And if I'm not careful, I will still be my ego. I will still be my pride. I will still be self-centered and self-seeking. Even when I'm pouring my heart out to you, it's all about me. What can I get out of this? It's always about me. So we are our ego prior to uh, the spiritual transformation, including making meetings. Here's a good way to look at how my egos uh, are flaring up. Do I have to shake hands and say hello to every single person at meeting? Or can I just sit down and be stuck? A 
Well, if I don't say hello, they won't like me. They think I'm not going to go to say hello. I guess say hello, I guess say hello, I guess say hello, and they say hello to them. Even though I like you, I'm going to still say hello to you because I want everyone to go, wow, you're a great guy. What a spiritual giant. He said hello to everybody. And I go out with me and my ego into the car and go home. And then I put my head on the pillow and something's really wrong. Because I haven't done anything to get my soul food. That's why the meetings don't keep us sober. It's a fellowship. It's a band-aid on an open wound. So when a book says concede, when a book asks me, concede to my innermost self. Is God everything or nothing? What was my choice to be? They really meant this literally. It wasn't just a nice group of words that, that Bill put together. And then for those of us who've been around here a little while, a couple of years or double digits, what's that currently look like? What does that third step currently look like? Has my ego reemerged? Well, the newcomers need to go through the steps. I went through the steps 20 years ago, and God damn it, I'm spiritual. And I never <laughs> How am I doing? How, te how teachable am I after five or ten years in Alcoholics Anonymous? How teachable am I when I hear someone say something that I never heard before, and it sounds a little radical? How teachable am I when the sponsor sits me down and says, we're going to try the steps a different way out of the big book. It's to trick the ego. How teachable when I go into a big book meeting, the speaker just talks about um, everything but the big book. Do I shut him or her down in my head? I'm not listening to this. That's all ego. How, how am I telling you how you have to believe in you, how you have to believe in how you must go through the steps because I think it's the only way to go? It's all ego. And the neat thing about one of the, the, the byproducts of experiencing this power is a spirit of ease and comfort with everything. It doesn't mean I'm going to roll over. I will, me personally, I will challenge till the cows come home. And I get really excited about this. But coming from a place of ease and comfort is different than some folks who have this big book and become very, very angry at AA because they're not doing what they're supposed to be doing. It's all ego, which has to be dismantled and grinded into dust at some point during this process. And by me just attending meetings, it's not going to work. I'll get a quick fix for now and I'll feel really good. But what happens when I go home? Because that's really where it counts, not in an AA meeting. How am I doing when I'm out there? on a line in Publix, on 95 in traffic, tending to my children, spending time with my loved ones. How am I really doing then? Am I rigorously honest in all my affairs? Am I a man of my word? Or do I cut corners and lie? So the way I went through the steps, I can quickly go backwards through the steps as the ego starts to reemerge. I will endorse all of that. I'll start the steps next week. I'm going to go to this big book. I'll start the steps next week. I never left a little bit of a, a liquor in a drink in a, in a glass till next week. Uh, right? You drink now. Forget about tomorrow. We're drinking now. Drink it all now. We'll go out and steal to get money to continue drinking. But right now we are drinking. And what we tend to do, some of us do, in AAs, I will get it tomorrow. I'll start now. I'll finish next week. I got, I'm going on vacation. I'll finish my fourth step when I get back. I'm going to hear these things. It's bizarre. And then we die. So I, you know, concede to my innermost self. I take a look at my powerlessness, my lack of power, choice, control, my unmanageability with the drink, and my current unmanageability, sober in Alcoholics Anonymous. And if the real unmanageability is not having an idea what the day is going to look like when the drink says go drink, and I go drink, and I can't stop it. And I won't even have the ability to run to my home group to say, I want a drink, please help me because I'll probably get drunk on the way to my home group. That's how I drink. No human power can relieve me of my alcoholism. That's not only the drink, it's alcoholism, the stuff that accompanies alcoholism. My self is self-centered, self-seeking ways, my pride and my ego, all of it. Because we know just removing the drink doesn't mean I'm much better. When I got into AA in 1988, after 90 days, I was not sponsorship material. I was still sick untreated alcoholic. How I got here tonight is truly a miracle. I should have been drunk 50 times already in early recovery. But it was grace. And there was a reason why he kept me sober so I can do what I do now, I guess. But I found there's a big difference between having God's grace, which we're just given, and experience that power, which gives me grace. Big difference. And I can only get that by clearing out self in one through nine. 
what, what lengths am I willing to go to? Step one told me I'm drinking and there's no way out. I will drink. At some point, I will drink. I, I, I have new kids in front of me all day long at work. And I, I totally get it. You're in your 20s. There's nothing stopping you in your 20s. Not an old guy like me saying, get spiritual at 21. You're looking to rip up the town still. There's a way I might be able to cheat a little bit. And they all get drunk. They all get drunk or they all go get high. And some of them die. That's alcoholism. I mean, it's possible, and me included, that some of us in this room might die of alcoholism. There's no guarantee because I'm coming to Monday night 12-step that I'm going to be sober tomorrow. I don't know if I'm going to be alive tomorrow. This is it right now. My sponsors always tell me, Peter, what are you doing about the dash? I had no idea what he meant. What are you doing about the dash? As Mark, what does that mean? He's when you go to a cemetery and there's a headstone, the plot, there's a day God brought you in a gate. The day God takes you home, right in the middle, is a two-inch dash. What are you doing about the dash? Because that's all you got. Life is a vapor. Got here and gone. And we spend years getting drunk, trying to control and regulate. We spend years in resentments. We spend years in defects of character. We spend years bouncing in and out of alcohol synonymous. And the most means you got the 12 and 12. The medicine is there, but we don't eat. God prepares a banquet for every meeting I go into, and many of us go home hungry. As long as we're shaking hands and running for some sort of office in here, we're good. The truth will find me every time. I don't have to find the truth. The truth will find me. I'm an alcoholic. The guy on page 21, I will drink. And it won't be a day where it necessarily where it looks like a really bad day. It could, I'll win Powerball, and the thought will say, now we can really drink. We don't need God anymore. i got just enough money not to need God. But I will drink. So what am I doing while I'm in here? To stay away, not only from the first drink, but to experience this power called God. Because when we're in that place, what we do get to experience a day at a time is permanent sobriety which means everyone in this room will never drink again, never drug again. Everyone in this room, whether you got one day or a whole bunch of years, everyone in this room is guaranteed permanent sobriety. And when I say sobriety, we're talking about life that's joyous, happy, and free. Everyone in this room. Now, life is problematic. Things come at us. People die. People go away. Relationships break up. Money comes. Money goes. That's just the, the way life works. But how we navigate, how I navigate through that is in a place of being joyous, happy, and free. I'll get disturbed, I'll weep, I'll get angry and keep moving. I'm not just caught up in that. That's what alcohol is anonymous about. All hinging on my relationship with God. So what's our relationship with God look like tonight? How's that looking? Am I practicing fidelity to God? Or do I have other things? Am I cheating on God? Do I have other lovers? My money, my car, my relationship. All important very important relationships. Our loved ones are extremely important. God gave them to us. But I can't have them unless I have God. Because when I lose God, I lose that. So that relationship, that loved one that you worship, you adore, wonderful. Have a great life. Without God, you will lose it. And then I will drink and die. So step two is this consideration about this power is going to take me to a place of wholeness of mind. The interesting thing about this place of wholeness of mind is that my mind means I have this new, this new mind, this God mind, this renewal of this mind, the, the metanoia, the purging out of the old and embracing what was there at the beginning, this golden nugget that's way on the bottom of the haystack, which God gave us at birth. It's just been, I've accumulated things. I've accumulated belief systems and fears and anger and conceptions and perceptions about everything. I can't find my own way out. And what the steps do is clear off the path. Am I willing to go to this power to restore me to wholeness of mind? First, I'm not thinking about drinking. The obsession will go away, and even the thought about drinking will be removed. We're talking about God here. We're not talking about a human power that will kind of fix us up a little bit. We're talking about the boss. And when I get aligned with that power, there's no time for me or you to be thinking about drinking. Watch a beer commercial. Yeah, I used to drink that. You keep changing the channel. It's not like you want to dive head first into the TV. <laughs> we're doing a 12-step call. Yeah, I used to drink the same stuff while we're pouring it down the sink. We're not jumping into the drain. I remember I was 
into this work, uh, newly sober, had some knee surgery, and um, my knee was really banged up. I had crutches, and they gave me uh, pain meds, and I called my sponsors. You need to take them. And I took them for three days, and I never forget this. I got the rest and flushed it down the toilet, and I couldn't believe I was watching them go down the toilet. <laughs> but there was no, oh, my God, I'm really doing it. I didn't, have it. I didn't save any just-in-case medicine. <laughs> you know, just in The old just-in-case medicine. I didn't do that. And I was so happy. I mean, I remember going to an afternoon meeting and said, I don't believe what I just did. Not like I don't believe what I just did. I, I don't believe what I just did. This is so cool. It's called freedom. Wholeness of mind. The demons that I faced for so long, fear, insecurity, doubt, skepticism, hate, resentment, jealousy, the lust, the greed, all of that stuff that just had me like an anchor around my neck. Like the book says, drop the rock, I just, enough. But I didn't will that. That dropping of the rock, that enough came from a place of desperation once more. It was a surrender. I'll do anything to be free of this. And there was some action I had to take. And then one day I wake up and I'm saying, these demons aren't on me anymore. A day at a time. Because I'm not cured of alcohol, and what I have is a daily reprieve. And that hinges on my relationship with God. And step three was my decision. Page 62 talks about selfishness, self-centered, is the root of my troubles. I'm driven by a hundred forms of fear. I will die from, from a, 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 a thousand cuts, never one shot. I will die from a thousand cuts. No inventory, don't call the sponsor. Cut back on meetings, cut back on sponsoring people. A little dishonesty here, a little dishonesty there, a little bit more dishonesty there. Mismanage my money, um, not so, for, not practicing real fidelity in my relationship. And it goes on and on and on. I, I just bleed out. And I went, how did this, how did I get drunk? I've been going to meetings. I would die from a thousand cuts. Am I willing, when my sponsor says, am I willing to go to any lengths? Any lengths is any lengths. And it's not on my terms. That was made clear to me back in 1988, 89 with my teachers. Your life is none of your business. I didn't even get to the third step yet. And every time I did the third step, holding hands on my knees, every one of my sponsors says, your life is none of your business. I understood it the fifth and ten times through the work. The first time it seemed like what a radical proposal. But it had to be better than the way I was living because how I lived was awful, drunk or sober. Drunk or sober, an alcoholic cannot manage my own life. And no human power is going to relieve me of this alcoholism. Drunk or sober. The ego wants to tell me, well, you go to meetings, you speak a little bit. You have to still write inventory. Do you know how many folks I speak to with double digits when they hear me writing inventory? They say, you still write inventory? <laughs> well, excuse me for breathing. I'm sorry. <laughs> so I make a decision in three to get there. And the bottom of page 62 talks about, this is the how and why of it. We had to quit playing God. Had to quit playing God. Why? It doesn't work. And I got to see, as I start step four, how I have been playing God in every area of my life, my entire life. Expectations, secretly demanding that people do what I want. The relationships, she better do this. She better say, I love you on cue, in a certain inflection too. <laughs> I never forget sponsoring uh, this, this young fellow. And he came to a home group. I was living in Staten Island. And he, he looked like he was dying. I, what happened? He was in this relationship the week before. He was joyous, happy, and free because he met Mrs. Wright. Everything was cool. So what happened? And he, he was sharing some intimate details. And, uh, well, we didn't make love last night. She's leaving me. As you made love to her six nights in a row, the poor girl's tired. What's the problem? <laughs> But the problem is because it's all about me. And you're not doing exactly what I want on cue. This is how I operate. This is how this young fellow is operating. We play God in every... We even I assign God role, a role to play. God loves me, so I'm going to hit the power ball. He loves you, but loves me a little bit more. So when I get my ticket in there, he's going to give me power. Then I get pissed off when I don't hit. We assign God a role, we assign people a role, we assign everyone a role, and I have a role to play as well. And I'm always in collision with everyone. 
the interesting thing it talks about on page 62, I go from all about me and all my self-reliance instead of God-reliance, all my self-centeredness instead of God-centeredness, go to page 63. We didn't even get to step four yet. And they talk about the transition, the transformation that's going to happen to us at some point or immediately on the third step is that I will be less and less thinking about me and more and more thinking about you and what I can contribute to life. How I can serve God better. In one page, it's a third step promise. It is the third step. And what I was able to do, what we're able to do is recite this third step prayer with the sponsor, hopefully. And if we miss a few words, it's okay. Because what I have found out, it's the intent at which I hit that prayer with. And again, I'm not commanding the spirit, but I'm showing my willingness and and displaying my willingness to be changed right now. I stand ready. And if it means I'm going to work in the Salvation Army for just a few bucks a year, and that's going to be my life, if I'm right with God, it'll be paradise. No conditions on this. This is God's deal. Now, the first time I went to the work, I I, I didn't get all of that. But I kept chopping wood and carrying wood. I get it now. In fact, I get it more now, sober a few years, than I did at the beginning. And the more dependence, the more reliance I need upon this power called God. And I think my actions, for the most part, show that. I'm seeking. I'm serving. I'm serving and I'm seeking. And very often, uh, it's not about me. I'm not perfect. Sometimes it is about me. But very often, it is not. And that's why my life's pretty much an open book. You walk with me. You tell me. I have no problem with people walking with me to see how I walk this walk. And that's not being boastful. That's just, if I didn't say that, it'd be false humility, huh? So the third step was about me turning everything over to God, and I don't stay there. And sometimes I hear folks say, work a really good third step, hang out in the third step, get a good third step, read the third step every day. If that's what floats your boat, that's great. It's not what the big book says. It is not what the big book says. It's not what I say. What the big book says is, next, we launch out on the course of vigorous action. So I do a third step prayer with you now, and in five minutes, you're starting your fourth step. Unless you have a notepad and pen, you're going to start immediately. There is no time to wait, because as I keep turning it over to God, and if I don't, the illness is right behind me looking to pull me back. I'm being pursued. So I better get right with God right away. Because the illness doesn't care how long we're sober. The illness doesn't care I go to lots of meetings. It's looking to pull me in. And what this this thing will do is throw up roadblocks. It seems like a a priest once told me, the closer in a sense, because there really is no proximity with God, but the closer I'm getting to God, this thing breathes even louder and screams even more to pull me down. It doesn't want me right with God. It doesn't want me in an AA meeting. It doesn't want me doing this work. So it will create roadblocks all in the mind. And we'll we'll justify some things as to why I'm not doing step four. Well, I had a long day today. I need to make dinner. I need to watch, you know, the Academy Awards. This is important, right? Something. I need to do something other than get my soul food. Now, I was talking to Jimmy and Mary, but I always tell this story uh, about my first fourth step. And um, I was living in this uh, apartment, this little studio apartment. I had come from the gutter, literally in the street, and I had this little studio apartment. And I had what was a bookshelf. Uh, I turned it into a desk because I had nothing. So I used this little bookshelf, my first fourth step, um, as a desk. And I had a little lamp on it. And... Um, I began writing my fourth step. I'm sober 25 years and changed. So this thing is, is old. And I didn't know Jimmy Maribeth have it in storage. I'm going to have it shipped to my to my apartment as soon as I can. I thought it was gone to the universe. And so it's very important because I remember forging this out on this notepad on this bookshelf. It's the only thing I really had in the place. I had an old futon on the floor, and that was it, and the telephone. It's really interesting about this the first time I did the fourth step, really out of desperation that I was doing. Because now I was clear, I don't want to go back to drinking anymore. I will do anything. And this is if this is all I own for the rest of my life, I'm okay because I'm not using. And I'm really trying to do right during the day. I'm showing up for work every day. You know, I'm calling my dad regularly rather than him fine, trying to find me. 
I'm sending letters home to my family that I love them, and just, you know, in the middle of the month, no holiday to do that. And I'm really trying. I'm attending meetings, and I really want to get well. And God gave me the power to do it. It's interesting when we're doing God's will, how right we feel with that. And when we're not, how sick we feel and the emotional hangover we get the next day. And there I was, I would sit down with my big book and I have my notepad and pen. There were my instructions. And I remember create, making prayer and creating this master list of names. All the people I was resentful at. His mom, dad, my brothers, my grandparents, friends. I went back to God. The book says we went back through our lives. Nothing counted but thoroughness and honesty. Now, I can't be thorough like that. I can't be honest like that. I can be a little bit honest. I can be a little bit thorough. But we're talking about going all the way in. Here's our third step. There's no amen after the third step prayer because it's a movement. Three, God, take me by the hand. We're going in. And when we're done in seven, we close up with the amen. Now we go out and fix. So God's taken me into this, this into the hood of my life. <laughs> And we all have our stuff. The things that we don't want to see the life day, the things we don't want to remember, the things we just tuck away. If I don't think about it, it won't live. It grows in the dark. And God puts a floodlight on all of it. What I want to, uh, uh, what I'm being moved to say, it's really important, especially if you never did a fourth step. Things will come to the surface that you thought you forgot. Even going through the steps a whole bunch of times. Things will come to the surface that are going to make us uncomfortable. It's not me who's bringing it to the table. It's not you who's bringing it to the table to write. It's God revealing to us what needs to be revealed. We said, God, get me free. Everything is yours. He's okay. Here it is. Here's what's in the way. It totally contradicts what the ego wants, what the self wants. And I got to see how I've been living with the ego. I am the ego. I am this false self, not the self God created. I am this, 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 this puppet. Whatever the ego says, I did. And God's saying, we're going to shut this down now. We need to get free. Because you told me in step three, I'm taking over. And God really thinks you mean it. So I create this master list. And whatever goes on paper, if I'm following directions in this book, and I'm praying to be searching fearless and moral, and I'm giving thanks when the writing is over, and I'm being uh, uh, truthful and surrendering to God with this and doing all the things I'm expected to do, then that fourth step in spirit is a perfect fourth step. I hear too many people say, oh, there's no such thing as a perfect fourth step. So God is imperfect. When did I become bigger than God to even make a statement like that in Alcoholics Anonymous? Your fourth step is perfect. In spirit, there's mistakes. We'll fix it. We'll do another fourth step. But that writing, the intent is pure. That's what God gave me to write. I have to say that this is perfect. And my sponsor will tweak and listen and push and pull. Maybe explore some more. This is complete letting go here. So God will reveal to us in his time. Every time I go through the steps, sometimes things pop up that I didn't even know were there. The ground's fertile enough to God put it. Do some more work with me. The need to continually go through the work. What I have found, I was one of those guys who uh, would go through the steps one time. And I speak for myself with this one. Go through the steps one time and one time only and live in 10, 11, and 12. And around 10 years of sobriety, I start to experience some uh, restlessness, irritability, and discontentment. And I start to be a little AA cop. <laughs> People would talk about the big book, and I'd analyze instead of listening. Reemergence of ego. And a gentleman was up from Texas, and uh, I went to him, and I asked him if he can sponsor me. He said, I've been waiting for you. He said, are you ready to have your whole life turned upside down? And I was still in that place of, it's got to be better than where I am. And I began going through the steps over and over. At least once a year, I go through the steps. I don't, I don't just the way God has disciplined. I've been disciplined to the spiritual life. So 1 through 9 into 10, 11, and 12, but some folks will go through the steps one time and one time only. And if I'm, if I'm defending that, if I'm fighting off people who continually re rework the steps, it's my ego flourishing again. Oh, you don't go through the steps more than once. I don't want to hear about it. Why are you getting so defensive? Because it's become a threat. It's become a threat to my ego. And I spoke to uh, this gentleman named Paul Martin, who's my great-grandson.
one sponsor. He was sponsored by Dr. Bob. Spoke to him a few years ago. I had a handful of phone calls with him. He was out of uh, Chicago. And I asked him this question about going through the steps over and over again. And he said firsthand what happened, because he was one of the guys, one of the first the, the spearheads of going through the work over and over again. He says, what the book doesn't tell us, the stories in the back of those early members, what happened to a lot of us, he said, after about five years of sobriety, we start to visit page 52 a little too often. We were looking for some sedative, some, some medication, because we were nervous. We were full of ang uh, anxiety. We had some fear going on, and we were doing all of this, but there was something going on we couldn't locate. Some ran to psychiatrists, and some got drunk, and so on. And uh, truly, by the grace of God, he had one of his uh, uh, guys coming over to hear a fifth step off of him. And he was praying to get ready for this fifth step. And what he said was he had this intuitive thought that he couldn't deny. You know, when God moves you, you get moved. When God speaks, you know it. And he stopped putting some things together on paper. And his idea was what he calls swapping inventory. He was going to hear the prospect's inventory and say, can you listen to mine? That's what he did. So his little sponsee heard his sponsor's fifth step. And the sponsor went, uh, he went home and he was left in his apartment. And he, he took the directions and looked at some stuff in six and seven. And realized through between four, five, six, and seven, he had some outstanding amends he hadn't made. And he had some amends he wasn't even aware of and cleared up some things. By the time he hit 10, 11, and 12, he found this, this newfound freedom. There's something to this. That caught like wildfire. And it just kind of spread around. In certain lineages, you'll see people going through the work regularly. My question is, if you're hearing this now while I'm saying this, and you're thinking, oh, my God, that's horrible. Have you tried it? Do we have contempt prior, to, uh, uh, contempt prior to investigation? Because I did. When I would hear these guys tell me I go through the steps over and over again, I said, what kind of nonsense is that? <laughs> I went through it one time and one time only, and I'm proud of it. And then I bottomed out. So I've been on both sides of the fence, and I like this side a whole lot better. Now, if you're in a place you're going through the one time, your joy's happy and free, go. I'm not here to change that, but just challenge a little bit. So I wrote this master list in four, and I had this little bookshelf that was a, turned into a desk, and I make a whole bunch of coffee, because that's what you guys did, made coffee. <laughs> I don't drink it at night, but there it was. And I had a little light, and I sit there, and I come home from my meeting and write. My sponsor says, if you stay home and write, you can not go to a meeting tonight. If you stay home tonight and just watch TV and not write, we have a problem. So I'd stay home a couple of nights a week and write to sit, and I got done right away. I got, it was a lot. It was five spiral notebooks when I got done. It was a purging. It just kept pushing and pushing. And one of the things I was told to do was pray before I write. Write a prayer across the page. Thank you, God, for allowing me to be searching for this and more because I can't do that on my own. And then I write whatever came to the pen went on paper. No censoring, no denying. The pen is now the spiritual translator, huh? It's God working right through me. So I can't play with that. When we studied the, the early members, uh, they talked about uh, the confession of sins and things like that. They wrote a list, too. They took inventory. I forget who said it. It goes something like this. A life without inventory is a life not worth living. How many of us in AA actually do inventory and expect to have a life of abundance? Right. So um, I started writing resentments, and my first column talks about the names and to forget my first inventory I wrote was with mom. And I thought like the skies were going to open up and thunder and lightning was going to happen because it's your mom. How do you write a resentment about mom and my anger, even hate and disappointment that she commits suicide? How could she do this to me? It was still about me. Here's a woman who was sick and suffering, dying of alcoholism. The will to live was taken from her by alcoholism. And I'm thinking, poor me. Self-centered. And so I would write my four columns. Second column talked about cause. Put the name in the first column, mom. Cause. She was alcoholic. She committed suicide. And that's what we do with the second column. Just an instruction here. It's easy to go from column to column to column rather than writing straight across the pages. Too much shifting. And so that's what I was taught to do. Second column, I put the reason why I'm angry with that person. It came to the third column, which is very interesting because I didn't know this the first time writing. I was just following directions. 
third column is explained to me, go for it. The third column is really, really seeing how I interpret the world and then how I operate in column four. The seven areas of self, my pride, how I think you view me. No one should see me in a certain, in a compromising position. No one should see me and my spouse argue. No one should see my boss uh, uh, reprimand me. No one should see me falter because you're going to think less of me. If you think less of me, that means you don't like me. If you don't like me, that means I lose your friendship. If I lose your friendship, that means I'm all alone. I'm all alone. I'm abandoned. Oh, my God, I'm going to die. How many of us... It sounds extreme, but how many of us, like maybe we go to the bank account and you find out your funds are a little low, or some of us have been laid off at work or lost our job, and in a heartbeat you got yourself cleaning windshields by the Holland Tunnel in New York. <laughs> in one breath. It's all over. Right? That's what we do. My personal relationships is another area of self and third con. How I think this relationship should look. Everyone should like me. I should like you. We should be on the same page. One for all, all for one. And you're not liking me. You just had an argument. That's because you feel threatened. I have a problem. Basically because I'm assigning you a role. My self-esteem, how I feel about myself. My sex relation, not only just too much sex, not the right kind of sex. But what I think a man should be and how I think a woman should be. My pocketbook, my money. No one should touch my money. I should not have to pay taxes. You have to pay taxes. I shouldn't have to pay bills. You better pay bills. No one takes my money. It's my money. I am my money. We live in Boca. We live South Florida. A lot of people walk around. I am my money. Right? I am my money. Look at me. I'm rich. I'm great. <laughs> What happens when the money goes? Because it's on loan from God anyway. It's not my money. My sponsor told me a long time, it's not your money. It's not even your job. It's not even your relation. It's not even your house. God says, here, go play. Be a steward of my stuff. How am I doing with that? My emotional security, what I need to be okay. What I need from you to be okay. And this is a real tip-off to my attachments to external conditions. I need you to do certain things and say certain things, and then my ambition, what I want. Here's the trick, though. The first three columns turn out to be, even though they really happen and they're in black and white, the first three columns turn out to be one big lie that my mind has played on me. I get to see my fake, my perceptions and conceptions, my illusion and delusion about everything. I've been living with me and my ego. That's why these things have happened to me. This is why I become angry. My expectations on other people. If I was in the sunlight of the spirit, none of this stuff would affect me. I wouldn't would be hurt into fear or threatened. And what my fourth column reveals to me is what I do because of my feeling hurt, threatened, interfered in the third column. I become selfish, dishonest, self-seeking, and frightened. I say certain things. I do certain things. I interpret certain things. We go to coin night, anniversary night, Academy Awards, right? <laughs> so I'm in the back, we'll pretend with my little sponsee who's about to get coined. And everyone's getting applause, and all the sponsees are getting applause, all the sponsors are getting applause, and I'm saying, boy, I worked hard at all and get this guy one year. And when I go up and present, I take four hours to give a presentation <laughs> on what I've created, this one year newbie. While I'm sitting there, my self-centeredness is saying, hmm, what am I going to do about this? I know what I'm going to wow them. I'm going to show them all the work they did. My self-seeking was then I actually go do it. The plotting and the doing, and that is the first truth that I got to see in step four. I got to see me in action. That's the first truth. And those are the things that need to be changed. And I did a fear inventory. I got to see my fears and what I do in the face of fear. What I do in the face of fear is control even more. I need to control. I will run away to control. I will be on you to control. But what do I do in the face of fear is all self-reliance, not God-reliance. My book says, promises me we will outgrow fear based on my relationship with God. Huh? We're not talking about fear where, God forbid, the building's burning down. You say, oh my God, pull the alarm box, let's get out of here. It's fear when I'm sitting on my couch and no one's around. 
I'm driving in my car or perhaps sitting in an AA meeting, and I got the chatter of a thousand voices telling me what, what I'm like, who I should see, where I should be, how much money I should have, and I'm gripped in fear. Oh, my God. My voice tells me I'm a loser. I will never amount to anything. And I get gripped in fear. I can't live with that guy anymore. It'll kill me. It'll take me back to a drink. The fear of what people think of, how I sound, how I dress, what I drive, where I live, how much money I make. And the voice in the head that tells me, no matter what I do, you're still a bum, you're still a loser, you're still a, a, a dope thing. And you get gripped in fear. Oh, my God. My sponsor used to joke around, and he used to do this. I need a job, I need a job, I need a job. Then he gets interviewed. Oh, my God, I got an interview. Oh, my God, an interview. It's always fear. And then I did the sex inventory. Interesting, uh, when I went to share my fifth step, my first one, when it came to sex inventory, I couldn't even read my own handwriting. It was all squibbly writing. <laughs> Why? Because there was so much shame and guilt behind it. Real men don't do this. Real men don't feel this way. Real men are loyal. Real men practice fidelity. I have none of it. How am I going to share this with another guy? Compromising positions. Oh, my God. Am I going to do this? I don't want to share this. Fear. I'm out. But it was one of my many, many lengths. And when I sat down with my sponsor, we did the whole thing. We came to sex and the attorney says, uh, okay, what are you afraid to tell me? First question, what are you afraid to tell me? In fact, my, my second sponsor did the same thing. What are you afraid to tell me? I said, I'll tell you anything. No, I wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm reading it, and I, I'm squinting. Before I was wearing glasses, and I'm squinting. He says, let me see that. And he's, he didn't make fun of it. He says, how much shame and embarrassment do you have behind this? I said, well, I'm embarrassed to talk about this stuff to another man. He says, we're going to stop. He says, I want you to go home and write inventory on being shameful and embarrassed about your sex inventory. Put it in a fear inventory. And I came back the next day, shared it, and we began. And one of the things he did for me in the fifth step, I'm getting ahead of myself, was he shared some awkward moments that he experienced. His lack of fidelity, his disloyalty, his verbal and physical abuse, and the things that happened to him, etc. He anteed up first because he knew how important this was that he pulled me ashore. So we kind of anteed up. I took a deep breath and off I went. And he never, he never judged. And he just listened. He, he, he kind of guided me through that. I found that I wasn't that different. I wasn't that unique, and more important, I wasn't dirty. I was just broken. It's what I became, the things I did, under the influence or just untreated. That's what we do. This is what I'm capable of doing. Here it is on paper, my fourth step. And what, a, what, a God, what God will do is erase all of it. And we'll start clean on his terms, not my terms. In fact, doing four and five is really a demonstration of me willing to live on God's terms, not my terms, because on my terms, no one has to know this stuff. I feel good. I got a tan, <laughs> went to the gym, always looking for the external to get right rather than the internal. So I finished the sex inventory, and over the years, I will tell you, my, my teachers have uh, taken the book and uh, switched up some questions to what they call trick the ego, because the ego knows sex inventory is coming, the ego knows fear inventory is coming. So they kind of play with the questions and expand it a little bit, open up the third column, different techniques, different influences out of the book, so the ego doesn't write the inventory. I remember uh, uh, there was a gentleman, he's passed on, this guy from California, Joe H., he says, let me hear what you wrote. So I had everything in front of me, and I'm ready to share with Joe H. My, some of my thoughts step over the phone. He's going to say, great, you're Moses, good job. And he laughed. And he says, your ego is all over that. And he had me do this, which was just wonderful. Every resentment I had, he told me, write the opposite. Every fear I had, he told me, write the opposite. And this inventory became like this. But boy, did I get free. I remember going through the work, uh, maybe it was the fifth or sixth time through the work, and uh, I, I'm sitting down to write, and I'm thinking, I probably have about five names, ten names to write. I'll never forget it, 79 names showed up. Because the ego wasn't writing it. The names just kept, you know, popping up. Now, for those of us who go through the work more than one time, uh, what I have experienced is this. I might write about mom, the first inventory, first footstep. 
second, third, fourth, fifth. There's nothing wrong with that. There's more needs to be revealed. Certain things are not, not reconciled yet. So just keep writing. Let the pen be the spiritual translator and keep writing. And I got done with this fourth step, and there was a sense of accomplishment. It was difficult at times, but it was a sense of accomplishment. I will share this. Between ages 8 and 10, I had this, this, this relative, I'll call him a relative, who did inappropriate things with me. And uh, I'm writing about this guy. And it came to the fourth column, and it says, what, where was I at fault? Where was I selfish, dishonest, self-seeking, and frightened? Where was I selfish, dishonest, self-seeking? I was eight. This guy should have been locked up. And I can feel myself getting agitated and, and angry. And my, I start to relive it. My eyes were watering. I was starting to become teary and angry at the same time. And so I closed the book, and I was really annoyed, and I, I called my sponsor, and the first person I spoke to was his girlfriend, and she was an Al-Anon black belt, and bless her heart. And she kind of took me down off the ledge. And uh, my sponsor, his name was Tony, he got on the phone, and uh, we talked a bit, and he shared some things that he went through. And he says, let me ask you a question, where you're at fault. He said, never forget, he says, how long have you been hating this man? I said, Tony, I despise him. I, I, if I can get him alone now, I'd probably beat him up. I'm, I'm an adult. I'm not a little kid. He said, that's where you're at fault. Stop hating. Don't have to have a relationship with him. Don't have to hang out with him. Don't even have to like him. Stop hating. And forgiveness was going to be the medicine to, fi to fix me. Forgiveness. Forgiveness doesn't mean we're friends now. It just means I'm off the hook. And somewhere in there, I might let you be instead of cursing you to hell for the rest of my life. Because as long as I'm doing that, I'm going with you. I got on a plane to Montana. He's coming with me. <laughs> forgiveness heals. They've done some studies on this with forgiveness. Something happens within me that heals me in forgiveness. And he says, all you have to do is pray for the willingness to forgive because you're not there to forgive him yet. You're not in that place yet. Pray for the willingness to forgive this man. Forgive them for they know not what they do. He did it. Mocked, tortured, spat out everything. Forgive them for they know not what they do. He could have said, you know who I am? I can do it. What an order I can't go through it. Here was one of my any lens facing me. Eyeball to eyeball in, 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 my, in, my, in my fourth step. First, one of the biggest ambulance I, I, I came into right at the get-go. Sex inventory. Writing the step down. Resentment inventory. How am I going to do this? But I did it. And we shared about it. And it wasn't so bad. I found that I wasn't dirty. It wasn't my fault. Everything's okay. I'm safe and protected. It was one of those things. And I will tell you this. Um, I've seen this person... Uh, at a few events, and um, I was waiting to get angry. You know, come on, God, give me some anger. You know, this, this is good. Give me a reason. He was way on the other side, and I was over on this side, and um, I saw him. I didn't feel dirty. I didn't have a movement to me to go punch him in the mouth or say, you know, you do, I didn't do anything. I couldn't care. I couldn't care. I was whole again. I was complete. I had dignity and integrity now. And I knew no one could ever do that to me again. My walk is different. And I didn't think much about that feeling. I, I never forget that. I, I wasn't saying, wow, I must be really on a spiritual path. There was no thought of that. It was just, I don't care. I didn't realize how free I had gotten. just out of the mercy of God. Where I had dishonor, I now have glory. That's who we get in Alcoholics Anonymous. What was old become, dies and we get what's new, God. Die to the old to experience the new. It's in any lens that we have to go to, God. So at the beginning, step four seems really difficult. It isn't. It's new. That's why it seems difficult, and we're on a path we never experienced before, but it's one of the any lens. And when we speak to folks in AA who've done uh, 4 through 9, as the book says, into 10, 11, and 12, they are different people from the inside out. 
And when that transformation happens, because AA, we will learn a lot of things, but it's not about getting an education, but it's experiencing God, the transformation. When that happens, you're talking to a new person. Some of us don't even look the same after going through this path and living this path. Everything has changed. Perceptions and conceptions about everything has been changed. And really, if you think about it, we go home. We're going back to what God gave us at the beginning. It, we, I call it change, but really, we're looking through the eyes of a child, like we're supposed to be around God, like children around God. In awe of God, the abundance of God. Just having a cup of coffee uh, in the backyard is like I'm having a cup of coffee in my backyard. Oh my God, this is spectacular. That's being like a child with God. That's what happens to us. The contempt, the poison, the anger, the resentment. There's no time for that anymore. It's been removed. And all I have to do is continue to get soul food and grow with that. Like I said, it's like kissing a newborn on the cheek compared to the work we used to do. That's all I got. Peace. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.